It's a special episode of The Overwhelmed Brain right smack in the middle of the week. Of course, this is pre-recorded, so if you're listening to this later, then you're probably not experiencing it in the middle of the week right when it was released. But, you know, if you're subscribed, then... Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. This is Paul Coliani. I am your host, a personal empowerment coach, and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical treatment. And uh, this is, like I said, a special episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. It is not airing on a Sunday. It's airing on a Wednesday. And the reason it's special is because I invited a guest on the show to talk about a challenge that a listener is having. And uh, this is experimental. This is what I was hinting at in one of my episodes previously about having like a um, a midweek show or something similar where I would shorten the weekend episodes a little bit to then throw a weekend show. I don't know if it's going to be shorter <laughs> yet, uh, but it is uh, the beginning of a process of experimentation to find out uh, where else we can take this show. And uh, one of the places I want to take it is outside of my brain (laughs) in the sense that uh, I'm still going to have my own insights and opinions on every episode, but why not get someone else who has done their own healing and growth and evolving to a place where they can now offer some advice, some suggestions, some wisdom so that you can get more to work with. It's the difference between having one resource or multiple resources. In this episode, you get multiple resources. You get my thoughts, my insights, and also Matthew Bivens' thoughts and insights. Who is Matthew Bivens? (laughs) He is a good friend of mine. I I met him through the podcasting space and the self-help space, and uh, he had me on his show called Having It All, with Matthew Bivens, and ALL is an acronym for Abundant Loving Life, I believe. And uh, he has also created another podcast with his wife called Doing It at Home. And that is not what it sounds like, but I love the double entendre there (laughs) because it's about home birthing. So if you are at all interested in home birthing uh, or another self-help show that uh, comes from a very practical standpoint, then Matthew Bivens has those uh, podcasts out there. You can find those in your favorite podcast aggregator slash app. And uh, we talk about it on this episode too. So I'm going to play you, this is why it's a special episode, I'm going to play you our conversation where I read a listener's email and we tackle it the best we can. Normally, I would read a listener's email and I would tackle it by myself. I wanted to get Matthew's perspective because he comes from a different background and we have our own history, our own resources, our own learnings over over our lifetimes. He is about, uh, what is he, 15, 16 years younger than I am. So, you know, I'm 47, he's 31, I believe. And so we have different perspectives of life. And a certain segment of the people listening will uh, relate to Matthew and a certain segment will relate to me, at least in life experiences and where we are. Although what you'll hear in uh, this episode today is that it really comes down to not age, not experiences, not your work, not your relationships. It really comes down to how you process things at your core what I like to call your emotional core. How are you processing and handling and working through and uh, healing and releasing what's going on inside of you? I mean, if it's negative, you don't necessarily want to release all the positive stuff, but you do want to handle the negative stuff 
Because the negative stuff inside, you know what I mean, you're holding on to regret, shame, uh, guilt, embarrassment, anger, all this stuff, it eats away at you. And I don't want that stuff to eat away at you. I want you to be able to heal from that and release that stuff so that you can move on. So there are no obstacles on your path to whatever your greater vision is for yourself, whether it's happiness, peace, health, wealth, romance, everything, spirituality, anything that really motivates you and compels you to improve yourself to get to that place. It's like investing, like uh, Matthew says in this conversation, investing into emotional savings accounts. I forget how he says it. (laughs) We both use different analogies and different terminologies. And it's great because, like I said, you get two different uh, brains coming at the same challenge for the listener that wrote in. So I'm going to get this show on the road. It's a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it and I hope you get something from it. And I appreciate you tuning in midweek. I'll come back when we're done. talking to Matthew Bivens. He does the Having It All podcast. He also does the um, Doing It at Home podcast, right? Yes, yes, that's the name of it, Doing It at Home. All right, well, you know, when we met, you reached out to me and you wanted to talk about personal growth, self-development, and all this other stuff. and um, All the fun stuff. All the fun stuff, all the, the hard stuff. I mean, it's yeah. easy and it's hard. It's like there's a few steps that you do in life that if you do them, you know, I'm going to honor my boundaries. It's easy to say, but doing that in front of your boss, in front of your loved ones, in front of your narcissistic mom, in front of your abusive alcoholic father, you know, all this other stuff is hard. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, how do you do these, quote, easy steps in life? And um, that's something I've been tackling. And when I started talking with you and I was like, hey, let's get together. You live close by. So you had me on your show. Great conversation. And then I went and connected with you in a Panera Bread or something. And uh, one of the things I really appreciated was something that I always look for in people, a humbleness uh, about what they know, uh, a willingness to be open to learning and to being wrong, and an authenticity that uh, you seem to exude out of you. So I really appreciated that. And, you know, we could look at someone and figure out how much personal growth they've done inside, not necessarily by how many seminars they've attended, not necessarily by how many books they've read, but how they present themselves. And you can tell that when you go through life and you experience the failures, which are our best personal growth lessons, then and you learn from those failures and you bring them into your current life, and you don't act like the guru on the mountain, but you present it humbly like, you know, this is what I went through. And, you know, if this is, if this works for you, great. And if it doesn't, there's probably something else that you can look for that might work for you because I don't have all the answers. And so, you know, I I believe that you have a, a, a variety of these components, which is why I wanted you on this show. And I have a feeling, which is why we resonate a lot when we connect in the real world, outside of the virtual world here. And uh, I really appreciate that about you. So, and another thing I like is that you are younger than me. You have a different perspective. You grew up in a different generation. You know, I'm 47 now. You are what? 31. 31. Okay. I thought you were like 28. So 31. (laughs) So, you know, I look at that as that age difference of the type of people that are growing up in the world. Like I didn't grow up with uh, maybe you didn't either but with cell phones and you know that kind of technology when i when i drove around and my car broke down uh, i would have to walk to a pay phone <laughs> so, so, so things like that were different for me um uh, but relationships pretty much you know they've relationships i think have evolved uh, there's an acceptance of all different types of relationships that is more prevalent now than it ever has been so 
I, I really love how the world, or at least certain parts of the world, is evolving in a way of, I accept you for who you are and the type of people that you want to be with and um, your hobbies, your activities. It's more, in my opinion, an accepting societies again in certain parts of the world when you know there's no restrictions like that but you know here in the u.s i I see that a lot but even here in the u.s i see people against you know you shouldn't be with that person you shouldn't you shouldn't want to be that gender you shouldn't do this you shouldn't do that you see that everywhere so i think my whole point is at least just as a primer for what we're talking about here is that um as we go forward in time and the younger generations start growing up with this type of acceptance, with this type of evolution in emotional intelligence, in, in my opinion, again, that we are seeing a change in uh, society as a whole. So my whole point is, and we're, we're going to talk about a an email today we got about a relationship. And my whole point is as that changes, as people change, the relationships change, and we show up in the relationship as a more accepting, loving, kind person. We're still going to have the same emotional stuff happen. There's going to be lies. There's going to be deceit. There's going to be betrayals. There's going to be uh, hurt feelings. There's going to be arguments. I, I don't think that's ever going to change because we're so unique in our values and, and things that we believe. But I do think that as we accept our partners more and more and we're willing to come to the table with our emotions on the table and more honest, uh, more honest thoughts and feelings that we share that, you know, you talk about having an abundant life. I believe abundance comes from when you're willing to allow the most vulnerability to come out of you Mm. with the closest people in your life. And so I, I really like, again, the younger generation's, uh, perspective and acceptance that I see coming. So with all that said, some of that applies, some of that doesn't what we're, with what we're talking about today. But I've got um, this email that I, I wanted to invite you on and talk about. This is the first time I've ever, well, second time I've ever done this. I did this a long time ago uh, with a guy named Clark, and I really thought um, it was going to work out, but he kind of disappeared. Like we, we talked about one thing and it, it went well and then I never heard from him again. So I don't know if that was, I don't know what that was. I think he changed careers or something. He didn't want to talk about it anymore, but I wanted to talk to you about this. I have my own opinions on the emails that I get. And that's one of the reasons I wanted you on here is because my opinions and, and this is my humble, <laughs> vulnerable approach may not be perfect. It may not be right. It may not be the answer. It's just my opinion. It's my insights. And um, when I share that with the people that listen, some people are going to be like, that doesn't work for me. So I I really like the idea of a second person saying, well, this is how I approach it. Now, there are things that you and I will, will probably agree on most stuff, but there is the possibility where I go, well, Matt, I disagree. Yeah. (laughs) And this is why. It happened. (laughs) So I just want to kind of have the um the the field open to possible differing opinions that's why i i want to do this Go ahead. i'm looking forward to sharing our thoughts on a a single situation because like you said we have different perspectives come from different generations have had different experiences you know we share the common interest of looking into our emotional past and paying attention to some of those limiting beliefs and uh, you know, doing some of the rescripting work and and interested in in the personal growth um, from a very practical standpoint. So I think this will be very interesting um, as well. And I haven't done anything like this um, with my podcast having it all. Um, I do receive listener emails similar to uh, what we're going to be diving into, where people are sharing an experience, sharing something going on, and they want some feedback. And so uh, I, I'm I'm excited to hear how you approach something. Um, and then to, you know, toss what I can in the mix and, and see what comes out. So yeah. it's going to be fun. That's great. And, you know, I mentioned something earlier about how much education you must have to go into this personal growth and personal development space. And, uh, I, I think it's great to learn the information, but to live it. And one thing that you said, diving into your emotional past, 
is, oh my God, it's like um, an inner wisdom that you have inside of you that yeah. when yeah. you're able to heal from it, when you're able to evolve into a new space with it, it's like you have the information that's already been taught that you didn't have to read out of a manual. You just learned it. Everyone has this wisdom if they're willing to look into their past and get to a place of healing with it, which is difficult. That's why we do shows like this. But once you do, then you become just a bit of, a bit more emotionally intelligent, have that inner wisdom that you carry on with you so that you can make decisions in the future that create the life that you want instead of the, the life that might be thrown at you and you feel like the victim and you feel like, what am I doing wrong? You know, sabotaging your own path. Mm. So I really love the idea that, and the, something you just mentioned about diving into your past because a lot of people don't want to do that. Painful. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But that, that could be another subject for another uh, episode. But let me go ahead and read this email that I get that I'm going to call uh, someone who sent it. His name is, I'm going to call Bill. Cool. And uh, says, Paul, I found your podcast recently in a time of pain and it's helped immensely. I can't thank you enough. I've listened to just about all of the episodes regarding exes and how to get over your significant other's past. Thank you, Bill, for writing that. Uh, they help, that's for sure. But I just can't seem to get over my current situation as my girlfriend's past just won't go away. Maybe you can help. My girlfriend and I have been dating for just over a year now. Recently, I found out that she lied to me about going to see her ex-boyfriend while on a trip to another state. Okay, yes. <laughs> the trip occurred only a few months into our relationship, but it was a pretty big deal at the time. It almost ruined us. I was super insecure excuse me, over her boyfriend and the possibility of her seeing him. They dated for a few years and their breakup was messy. She was heartbroken. And around the same time we started dating, he started calling and texting her, trying to win her back. Not only that, I couldn't shake the feeling that perhaps she wasn't completely over him. Anyway, I got over it. I trusted that she wouldn't see him again, and I believed her when she told me she hadn't heard from him since that time. I knew I had to believe her and move on, uh, or else I would lose her. When she returned from her trip, everything about our relationship changed for the better. It was like we hopped over this relationship roadblock, and everything was so perfect afterward. We were both all in. No more insecurities, and our relationship grew beyond words. Over the next few months, he did continue to message her. It didn't bother me at first, but soon I began to wonder why their communication continued. Why was she continuing to communicate with him? She's a beautifully empathetic person, and I know that she felt bad and partly responsible for his sadness. But that familiar feeling of, hey, maybe she's still not completely over him, slowly began to creep its way back into my head. Anyway, in fear of becoming the overbearing boyfriend, I kept my feelings quiet for a while. It wasn't until we were both out with her friend and her friend's boyfriend that the topic arose organically. I filled them in on the messages my girlfriend was receiving and asked for their opinion on the whole situation, to which her best friend responded, Still, I thought you ended that when you were in, in that other state. Uh, keeping the details private here. Uh, my girlfriend's face turned white as a ghost. She knew she was caught and that she did get in touch with him while out there, even though she said she didn't. Mm. Uh, I was incredibly hurt and felt betrayed beyond words when I found out she lied to me and went behind my back to see him. In the moment, I felt myself ready to end it all. I mean, I think he means uh, break it up, break off. And then I caught this wave of, wait, is it worth it? I realized it wasn't. I knew I would regret it if I left her then because I would miss her forever. We were in a completely different place than we were at the time of the trip, and I loved her more than anything. Still, though, it hurts. We talked it out, and she explained her reasons for seeing him, and I believe her. But regardless of what I believe, it was in the past. It shouldn't matter anymore. I keep telling myself that. But every now and then I hear this little voice, something that triggers it, and boom, my head is filled with, hey, maybe something did happen. Or, hey, you'll always be second best. I know it's my insecurity to blame. I know I'll get over it, and it will pass with time. But when? Because right now, it hurts. More importantly, though, when will he just go away? Uh, but yesterday, she blocked him. Oh, I'm sorry. She blocked him, but yesterday, I saw that she received a text from his mom asking if they could talk. That's crazy. Am I, am I wrong to treat whether she responds or not as a deal-breaker? 
She knows my trust is waning, so you would think she would s simply not respond. I don't know. All of this shouldn't be a thing, but it continues to be a thing. I'm not sure what to do at this point. Thanks for listening, Bill. There it is. <laughs> yeah. There it all is. Wow. Yeah. So thank you, Bill, for sharing all that. That is a, um, that's a tough situation because, you know, speaking from a guy's point of view, when another guy contacts my girlfriend and they had dated, you know, I check in with my feelings. Now I'm a secure guy. I feel okay in our relationship. I feel confident in what we have, my girlfriend and I, but then here is this ex reaching out and trying to contact my girlfriend. How do I feel about that? Well, um, you know, Matt and I will talk about this in a moment, but you know, the first thought that comes to mind is how can I relate to this? How can I relate to this? Oh my God, this, this guy's reaching out. Okay. Well, first of all, have we talked about this guy before? If the answer is yes. And is he a threat to me? I mean, that might come up for me. Is this guy a threat to the relationship? If the answer is no, then I don't care. I, I mean, the, this is just my opinion. I don't care if this guy contacts her because I don't consider him a threat. Now, what you're saying is that this guy still isn't over her and is reaching out and wants to continue reaching out because he wants to keep a connection of some sort. And it sounds like your girlfriend wants to not keep a connection and break it off, but maybe her, um, maybe she's not honoring herself to the point where she blocks him completely when the mom calls, she blocks her, and I don't know. And I don't know if that's the right path or not. We're going to discuss this in a moment. But what are your uh, first thoughts about this, Matt? So, a huh. <laughs> number of things came up for me. I'll comment on something that you just said. Um, that, you know, he, the, the, the boyfriend in all of this, yes, feeling the threat from the other man, the former lover, um, and I get that because I have absolutely felt that. And but when it comes to her, just reading in between the lines and just thinking of what he said, she's not willing to let that go either. Mm. And like you said, maybe it's because she's not honoring herself, but um, there's something in it for her, and so she still has she still has those connections. But just in a from a, a broader ten thousand foot view, what came up for me uh, when when hearing about this situation, emotional attachment. That's pretty clear that there's some some strong emotional attachment going on. Um, there is a willingness to be treated a certain way by him. He's willing to take certain punches. And so when I think about that, I think of standards. Mm. Having standards versus not having standards and not taking a stand for yourself. You're talking and, about Bill, yeah. the one who wrote the letter. Exactly, exactly. Not taking that stand. Um, I think about that. Um, I think about focusing on things that you cannot control. You know, he mentioned that the girlfriend's past, right? It's the, the girlfriend's past is coming up and, you know, doesn't want that to happen. You can't really control that. You can't really control what the ex boyfriends and, and different, you know, those different people from the past are doing. But there is definitely a fixation on, wanting to control that and wanting to corral that and, you know, obviously stop it. Um, but I, I think that, you know, maybe turning that energy and uh, that's being projected outwards on what you can control in the outside world and instead look at what's happening internally um, could be more effective. So, you know, emotional attachment, I'm thinking about the treatment and standards. I'm thinking about uh, what you, you can and cannot control um, I also think there's elements of co-creation going on because, you know, I think that there's, uh, in, in these different situations, I'm not necessarily, quote unquote, victim blaming, but I do think that there is a responsibility on both parties, you know, and, and so uh, there are actions being taken or not taken by both parties that are creating the situation. I don't necessarily think that it's all one person. Yeah. You know, that might be the case in, in some scenarios, but I don't feel like it's the case in this one. No, I agree. Um, so those are my my big, broad, 10,000-foot view, um, little bullet points that come up for me when I'm listening to this and, and reflecting on it. Yeah, uh, good. And it doesn't sound fun. I'll just put it out there. <laughs> this doesn't sound like something I would want to experience 
now you know he's in a position bills in this position to like what do you do you know my, I, I don't trust her this stuff's going on i don't want to let go because i feel it's attachment like none of that sounds fun so i just want to acknowledge that like you know yeah. feel for you man yeah you can relate and um one of the things that you said had to do with uh, well first co-creation certainly each partner plays a role and takes a responsibility in what's happening right now Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what is that role? If she, uh, continues in any way, shape or form communicating with the ex or the ex's family, then Bill is not going to feel comfortable on himself. There will be insecurities that rise. And, um, because, and this is where the problem may lie, because she did visit her ex or connect with her ex in some way, shape or form. He believes that there was no cheating and maybe there wasn't. Maybe she's like, you know, it's over. You, you, you need to move on. And okay, great. But regardless, Bill believes there was no infidelity going on. So great. So now you take from that standpoint, nothing physical happened. And she probably was there to end the communication and the relationship. And he said when she got back, it was a whole new relationship. It was like this is what I want in a relationship. This is growing and everything's wonderful. However, she lied. Yeah. So, so now you have months and months and months of wonderful feeling and security and trust and feeling safe that you're with someone that can, uh, will tell you the truth and be honest. And, and suddenly you find out they've been carrying this lie the whole time. Mm -hmm. And as long as this lie doesn't come up and come out, then the relationship will be fantastic. Yeah. I've had some yeah. I've had so many uh, talks with my girlfriend about this uh, because there are people who do things in the relationship that they never tell their partner. And as long as the partner doesn't find out, the relationship is fantastic. And she goes, sometimes, this is funny, we have these arguments all the time. It's, it's a debate. Sometimes it's probably safer to keep that lie because you're having such a great time in your relationship. And I'm like, I completely disagree. <laughs> I think when, I it. when you're holding on to a lie that could absolutely devastate the other person, well, not devastate, but maybe, uh, then it needs to be brought out to understand where the relationship is going to go from there when you face the hardest of hard truths. And is your relationship capable of getting through that? And some relationships won't. Some relationships will fail after that. So I think it's like the cancer, you know, holding when, on to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we, you mentioned the word earlier on, I think we were recording, talks about authenticity. Yeah. You know, he talks about experiencing abundance when you are authentic and open and vulnerable and you, you know, you, you let those floodgates open. You can't do that when you're holding on to something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's one thing to not tell your spouse that, you know, you dinged her bumper and, you know, she's out there thinking that it happened at the grocery store. It's another thing to not tell your partner that you went to see an ex that you promised you wouldn't do. Like, those are two different lies to hold on to. And I think that that type of energy, holding on to that type of energy, it not only it does something to the relationship. It's that cancer to the relationship, but it does something to the individual. So I think that holding on to that stuff, the talk about how great the relationship is and everything's changed, you know, I, I, I'm not there. I'm not in Bill's relationship. So I can imagine that some elements of it have changed, but he had that nagging feeling. Mm -hmm. He had that feeling. At least that's what I understood from, from what you read, that there was that feeling that yeah. like, mm, Maybe there's still something, and there's a reason why that feeling was there, because there was still something. That's such a great point. I mean, what you just said, because when you're holding on to something that's, I don't know, maybe it wasn't festering inside of her, but here's a deception or a lie or a betrayal that I'm going to stuff away somewhere inside of me. So now I am carrying this around with me, and then I'm going to cover it with niceness and wonderful love, yep. and you'll never see that again. So here's me hiding the deception hiding the lie. But like you said, it's still in there and it's going to bleed out in little ways that will not be necessarily consciously uh, observed. But 
unconsciously, the other person, because our unconscious is brilliant, 99% of what we do is unconscious, it's all happening under the surface, uh, we'll figure out something's not right. Mm -hmm. And that not right feeling permeates the relationship and you don't know what's happening, but something's happening. And you get these little inklings of doubt and feelings that you're not sure how to validate or confirm, but they're there. And, yeah. and that deception is so deeply buried in your partner, if it's happened, that you don't know what to do with what you're feeling. So you continue the relationship. But the problem is that the rift is slowly getting wider and wider between you then and there might be a little passive aggressive comments made and there might be a little like i don't know why i'm angry or like he said he he, he experienced the 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 ex was still communicating in the first few months it was okay but it was it was still you know something very visible he could see mm -hmm. um and if he and this is i think maybe uh applies to your point here if he fully 100 percent trusted her then he could say man that guy's relentless it's too bad. She's mine now. It would be like no, yeah. it would be no issue. Yeah. He can try all he wants, but I trust my girl. She's always going to say, sorry, it's just not going to happen between us. You know, I hope you have a great day. Or whoever, maybe she's just being kind. Maybe she's one of these two nice people. Always too nice to even to the people that you break up with and you're always, you know, never, you never want to hurt their feelings. Uh, but, you know, certainly Bill's intuition's kicking in because I believe he senses that deeply buried betrayal. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? If if we were to look at this a little spiritually, how interesting it came out in a conversation with their friends, and she said the exact words that triggered this whole thing. And you, it makes you wonder, you're like, is this a setup? Is this karma? Is this something uh, beyond? It is very interesting, yeah, to have the organic conversation. It just happens to come up. And boy, I, I can only imagine what it was like to be in that gathering when the friend, you know, accident, well, not accidentally, but unintentionally called out his girlfriend and I could just see the face going white. And then I can only imagine what it was like to be her and to hear that the conversation was starting to be brought up. I'm sure she was panicking inside or anxiety mm -hmm. was starting to raise. And then to receive that question from the ex or from, from her friend, realizing that the lie was now exposed. Yeah. You know, it's a situation that uh, just doesn't doesn't sound like fun. It no. really doesn't. No. So uh, we've kind of had a big picture here on, on you know, how this looks and where this could go. We really haven't talked about where it could go, but I'd really like to maybe start diving in a little bit on uh, what can be done from this point. Like one of the things that I really typically rally against is holding on to the secrets that you know will upset your partner. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really, I typically rally against that. I mean, there are times if they're abusive, if there's danger to your kids, if there's other things that you really don't want your partner to know because of that, then, you know, I promote that. You, you know, you don't want to put yourself in any danger. But when it comes to the typical quote, normal relationship, and you hold on to a secret because it might upset him. That person might leave me. That person might yell at me. All these things that you hold on to, or some of the things that you hold on to, that if they're not brought out, they're not put on the table, and they're not talked about, you'll never test the strength of your relationship. You'll never test yeah. how, how long your relationship's going to last. Because if you're holding on to stuff now, guess what you're going to do next year and the next year? You're going to hold on to more stuff. Oh, yeah. It just adds up. It adds up. And then you have one of those, you know, avalanche type of conversations. Maybe sometimes it gets there where it's just like, all right, let me unzip this bag and dump everything out. Oh, and yeah. just like you said, it's it that becomes a huge test. Like, wow, are we going to be able to endure this? Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of coming out with the hard truths saying, honey, I have something to tell you. And, you know, whenever this kind of conversation happens, I always like to uh, and this is this is my advice for anyone listening. I always like to buffer a comment of, honey, I have something to say or I have something to tell you with the words, I'm afraid to tell you this because I know it'll upset you. Now, huh. when you buffer something that you want to say that you know will upset them with the words, 
I've been afraid to tell you this because I know it will upset you. They're more likely to reserve their upset. Not always. But what you're doing is tackling the resistance before it happens. So it really helps get some of the harder stuff out. I don't want to tell you this because I know it will upset you. Or I haven't told you this because I know how mad, mad you'll be. And well, I, well I, I don't want her to be right about me being mad. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I get that. That's, so I, that's great. So I might approach it differently. So I, I like buffering when the need is there just in case. And, um, because I, I'm, I really want you to get the, the truth out on the table. And, um, when that, when you can get that truth out on the table, then you have something to work with. Then there's none of that hidden unconscious stuff. Then the, their instincts, their intuition isn't firing off and they can't figure out what's going on. Let's get it on the table. Let's talk about this. And then we'll see if our relationship is strong enough to get through it. Because I tell you what, when you address it and you go beyond it, your relationship is so much stronger than it ever was. Because it, it, typically that's what happens is because I know my partner's going to tell me the truth. What a great feeling that is. What a great feeling that is to know that your partner is always going to tell you the truth. But when those hidden thoughts and emotions and everything that's happened is stays in there and your partner doesn't have that feeling, then there's always going to be a slight disconnect. There's always going to be to that, that a little bit of emotional disconnect. So, um, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to belabor that anymore. Go ahead. Well, I think, well, I think also with the emotional disconnect, there's, there becomes a distance, there becomes that crack and then slowly over time, it just widens and widens as neither person is letting the other person in on, on truths, on their emotions and people continue to hold things. It just becomes wider and wider. And then you have this, this long rift. And I think, you know, what, what, I've experienced because I went through a, a four year relationship where I was incredibly secretive. Mm. I was very insecure. Um, I just pro probably from the minute we started dating, I had the like, why is she dating me type of feeling? You know, I had very, very low self esteem. Wow. And I felt like aspects of my behavior and aspects of my personality would drive her away. So I hid them. Mm. And, you know, I, I hid a pornography habit mm. and every time I would indulge in that habit, it was like the little rift got wider because another secret I was adding in another thing. And then, you know, I think that on, on, the, on that subconscious level, she didn't feel like she could completely trust me. She didn't feel that she could be completely vulnerable with me. So here we are, two people who don't feel like they can trust one another are uncomfortable being being completely vulnerable and transparent and authentic with one another and continue to just pile on the either the deceit or the the emotions that could potentially damage the relationship and our relationship really had these mile markers of I wouldn't call them blow up conversations because I'm not the type of person who really who fights um, I don't think I've ever yelled at any of my my partners but, you know, we've all been in those multiple hour long, just like really drag out emotionally challenging conversations. And so this particular relationship had a lot of them because mm -hmm. at some point the weight of all the stuff we were holding or for me, the weight of everything that I was holding and all the deceits and all, all that stuff just got too much. And there was a crack, boom, and then something happened, <laughs> you know, something would happen. And so we would. We would have the conversation and I would, I would share some of my secrets and then we'd sort of clean up a little bit and try to keep it moving on. So I say all that because, you know, what I, what I see in this, in this situation from Bill is something similar with holding on to those, how you're truly feeling. Um, in, in her case, in his girlfriend's case, holding on to some, some lies and deceit. But when both parties are doing that, the, the rift just continues. You know, it's, it's sort of like um, the way an earthquake happens. You know, you have the two plates and there is tension and energy being built up over time on both sides. And it's built up, built up, built up, built up until in one moment the plates slip and the energy is released and you have this big quake. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. as opposed to just 
a lot of little energetic releases, you know, every week, every month over time. And you don't have to have that big type of blow up. Um, I see, you know, Bill and his girlfriend as because of everything they've been holding on to and all the energy that's being built up, having those big earthquake moments in their relationship. And then to what you had said earlier, it's like, if that's how you operate, then at some point when those earthquake moments happen, you're going to be testing the strength of the relationship. Yeah. Great analogy. Your, yeah. It's like, can your relationship withstand, uh, I don't know, what's, what's a large earthquake? 8.0? Is that a big one? <laughs> Pretty big. <laughs> yeah. So an 8.0 earthquake, because if you've been holding stuff in for years, guess what? That's what's coming. Yeah. And it's all about the buildup. And, you know, I've seen relationships go through this type of situation where they're holding on to something, an emotion, an anger, something, some sort of upset. They're holding on to it, but they don't want to talk about it because everything, every time they talk about it, there's no resolve. Yeah. I'm going to be mad at you. I know you're going to be mad at me. Uh, so there's never a resolve. So what we're going to do is argue, uh, until we're blue in the face or red in the face about the garbage that hasn't been taken out, the, the dishes that haven't been washed, the, the fact that you don't put the kids to bed, the fact that this, the fact that that, that you haven't called so and so, the plumber. So there's all these little things that become the issue that aren't really the issue. They, yeah. ke- they keep, yeah. they keep the pressure building and it almost always, it, I've seen other things, but it almost always turns into minor passive aggressiveness to major passive aggressiveness because we know we can't talk about the issue. So I'm going to make snide remarks, smart comments, and hopefully you'll get the message that I'm still upset about that. And pretty soon the issue that the real issue is so far buried that you almost forget what you're mad about because you're mad about everything else because that's, yeah. where, that's where you've applied all that energy to everything else. Yeah. So you, um, you mentioned, uh, something about taking a stand, like there's, there's a place in your relationship where you take a stand and I might equate that to like, okay, I'm going to honor myself going, going into self-protective mode here and I'm going to say what's on my mind and do what I need to do. What, what do you think as far as Bill is concerned that that might apply here? So <clears throat> What I see and in, in hear in Bill's situation is, you know, when I say taking a stand, I'm talking about having those personal standards. And, you, you know, you say valuing yourself. Mm. What type of behavior are you willing to accept? What type of relationship do you want to have? You know, are, are, is your standard that, you know, in my relationship, we, on a consistent basis, share those things that are on our minds. We talk about some of those things, no matter how big or small they are. You know, are those the types of, of things that are within your personal standards of how you want to be treated or how you want to approach a relationship? I think it's important to define those uh, for yourself and then if you get to the point where you define them with your partner. Because, you know, when you're entering into a relationship, you're entering into an agreement. Mm. And if you think about agreements um, out in, in the real world, well, a lot of times they have uh, come in the form of a contract. And within a contract, you have different things that both parties are going to agree to. Criteria. I'm not, yeah, criteria. So I'm not saying enter into a legal contract with your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend. However, I think there should be some criteria or some common guidelines, something to which you can hold one another accountable. Because when when you don't have that and you don't have anything you can look back to, you you, you really just fall back on the emotions. You know, and, and somebody might be better, you know, more seasoned in playing the emotional game, you know. And so when I think of Bill, I think of, uh, first of all, the, the deceit, you know, his girlfriend that made a major withdrawal from his trust account when she said, I, I, you know, I'm not going to see him. I didn't see him. And then boom, she saw him. So that right there, Bill may have had a standard. A relationship standard like listen you make some sort of major withdrawal we need to take a break you know and then it becomes it's not it becomes simple but it's not easy right it's simple when you have your standards laid out and you say did you violate the standard yes or no yes you violated the standard great it's simple you know the choice is like all right cool we're going to take a break or whatever it is whatever is written out in your standards within your criteria but it's not easy because going back to the emotional attachment, it's not easy for any of these things. So, you know, getting back to Bill, I see, 
standards could have come into place right there with the uh, the the trust withdrawal from you know that his girlfriend made. When I look at that situation, I get the sense that she knows that she can get away with different things, you know, because Bill doesn't seem like the type of guy who's going to leave despite what is being presented in front of him. That's an excellent so, point. Can I comment on that? Yes, go for it. Um, when there's accountability in the relationship, first of all, I think that um, what you're doing is uh, showing that you have a certain set of values, like you said, certain set of standards, certain set of criteria. And uh, when you choose not to hold your partner accountable, then there's a chance that the system will be abused. Mm -hmm. Then there's a chance that, and, and one thing I want to comment on what you just said, why would she keep it from him in the first place? And that would be my question. Why would she keep it from him in the first place? This tells me that there might be a level uh, or a feeling that she has or a belief that she has that it's not safe to share everything with Bill. Because in order yeah, for potentially in yeah. order in order for this to develop, she must have already had this thought that it's not safe to share everything with him. And so this is pretty telling in a relationship and it is a good gauge on what you need to work on in the relationship because if your partner is afraid to tell you something they're not going to typically how do you change that you have to become a partner that provides what i like to call a safe zone i'm going to provide you a safe zone to share things with me where i won't judge i won't defend and call you wrong I'll just allow you to say whatever you need to say to me. I've talked about this on my show many times where, um, you know, like when I was married, my wife was really upset with me, really upset. And we had spent a lot of days arguing, me defending, me saying this is how she was wrong about me and so on and so on. But one day I decided, you know what? She's got all this pent up energy. And I wonder what would happen if I just let her scream at me and yeah. just, just sat there and took it. And so that, you know, that sounds like a very weak place. You're not honoring yourself, but I decided to try it. And boy, by the, by the end, I mean, she was saying like, I hate you and I hate you when you do this and all the things that I really felt hurt by, but just chose not, not to defend myself. By the end of that, she felt better. She was like, I finally got it all off my chest. I mean, she didn't say this stuff, but we talked about it later. And I, at the end of her, because eventually they're going to stop. Eventually it stops. I mean, it could take an hour or two. It could take longer. But eventually they're going to say everything they could possibly say about what's going on and just get it out. And I see that as the outer expression of inner emotion. You are pulling out what's inside you, what you're holding on to, and it's being expressed in any way, shape, or form. Scream, yep. screaming, yep. yelling, crying, uh, flailing, whatever it ha needs to happen. It's ex being expressed. Great. I, you release the pressure valve. That pressure is coming out. All right. And once that pressure is out, then who are they? And so I learned to do that in my marriage, provide that safe zone so that we could then talk about it. So uh, uh, that really changed the relationship and how we communicate. So this is what I see with um, Bill and his girlfriend is that has Bill given her the, the, the feeling of safety that it's okay to express things to him, even things that hurt, even things that he doesn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Like if she comes home and says, and this might be a little over the top, but she comes home and says, you know, I have this weird attraction to this guy at work and I don't know what it is. What's Bill going to do? What? Yeah. Yeah. Is he going to go, what? What do you mean? Are you leaving me? What What does that mean? Are you Are you thinking about having sex with him? Suddenly, she's going to close down. This is Absolutely. What, this is what kids do, too. It's like, mm -hmm. is ki if kids share something and the parent goes, you stupid idiot, and starts yelling at the kid, the kid's going to learn to lie. The kid's going to learn how to use some sort of coping mechanism or survival mechanism so that they aren't yelled at anymore, that they aren't hurt anymore. So I'm wondering if Bill put himself in this position 
unknowingly so that when this happened it was something that had already been you know set in stone it was going to happen she was going to lie because telling him would have been too painful for him to hear and he might be upset and he might I don't know, who, who knows cry he might have this fear he might have all these insecurities so i don't know what your thoughts on that but well you um it brings me back to where we're talking about co-creation i think that's a great example of how something like this can be co-created because you talk about the safe zone um i i, I think about it in terms of the the bank account that just works for me so i think of the emotional bank account or in this case the trust bank account and the trust account seems to have been low Obviously, with Bill towards his girlfriend, but with what you just described, she didn't feel like she was in a safe place to to share, and so there was a low amount of trust that she could tell him anything, and he would not react, you know, react emotionally as opposed to responding. And so I think of of you know, okay, what types of things could Bill be doing? to make small deposits in his girlfriend's trust account to bring that back up. And I know for me, that is not the first place that I think of going when uh, I have an issue with somebody else. Let me think about what I can do for them. Mm. I haven't been wired that way. And, you know, my, my journey with healing and growth, you know, has been challenging in major ways in part because, you know, Seeking to understand another person before being understood myself has been a concept that has been challenging to, for me to wrap my mind around. And that, that comes from Stephen Covey and his seven habits of highly effective people. But it, it, it really can work. I'm not going to say it works every single time. But I have tried in my life to, when presented with a situation that has a potential for conflict, when there is obviously low amount of trust, there isn't a safe zone. Instead of me wanting to be heard and understood and, and me simply, you know, wanting to get it out, really working on trying to understand that other person, trying to create that safe zone with the other person, trying to make those emotional deposits into that other person's trust account to build it back up. Because of what I've found is when the other person feels like they're in a safe zone, when they feel like they, they, they feel understood and when they feel like they can actually trust, then, like you said, Paul, it comes out like you can actually have a conversation and get past all of the emotional stuff because that emotional stuff, it's just like tar. Like it just it, it stops everything up. Yeah, it stops everything up. And I've been I've had an experience with my family, which I've talked about on, on my show because it's just been a, a really ripe ground for uh, opportunity and growth and humility within myself. But so many conversations, like we, we did counseling calls uh, with my siblings and my father and, and a counselor, and hours and hours and hours and hours of conversations, we weren't getting anywhere because there was the, the trust on both sides. It was just so low, mm. you know? Yeah. And everybody was trying to be understood as yeah. opposed to trying to understand the other person. That's so true. So when I think of, of Bill, um, I totally agree with you in the safe zone. And it, it is a bit counter to what you want to initially go to. You know, like, why well, I have to create the safe zone for you? You're the <laughs> one who, who violated my trust. And here I am. I have to do that for you. But I think that's where we step in and we have a little bit of maturity and have a little bit of humility and think about the bigger picture of what you're trying to create in the relationship and what you want to ultimately experience. And, you know, sometimes you might just have to fake it. <laughs> kind of like what it sounds like you did. You just you just bit your tongue and just let her go. clarify one thing is that that safe zone has to be set up before the blow up so oh yeah it, like you said you know okay i'll just i'll just sit here and take it i have to you know put my adult pants on and just sit here while she says um oh yeah i did lie about that i honestly don't have a problem with you going what <laughs> we we had something 
I'm now upset that you're telling me that you lied about it. What? You know, the whole idea is to create the safety so it never gets to that. But yeah, yeah. Because once you're, once you feel a huge violation or you, you understand a huge violation in your values or your relationship boundaries or criteria, then there's going to be a moment of upset. I don't think that needs to be swallowed. I don't think that needs to be like pushed down at all. If you're experiencing this shock, like, like I call it the shock to your system, there's a shock to your system. I need to do something with this energy. How could you? I thought we had this. You know, you might have an argument and then you let it all out. Uh, but after that, you know, you're letting out some honest stuff, even though it might hurt the other person. I don't have a problem with that it, unless it's your uh, your status quo. Yes, I was just going to say that yeah. unless that's the go to and how all the conversations end up going, then, yeah. you know, you might want to look at the effectiveness of that. Yes. And, and to your words, though, uh, I absolutely believe then this is where the approach comes. There's a difference. Here's the difference. There's a difference between finding out like what I'm finding this out for the first time. Uh, like you caught them, like, like Bill did in the conversation. Yeah. And your partner approaching you saying, I have something to share with you. So that's the difference. That's when, when your partner says, I have something to share with you. I want to express something to you. Then that's when you go, I'm creating the safe zone for you to do that. But when you catch them doing something and now you have the shock to your system, what do you do with that energy? You have to let it out. I mean, you could. If you're a bigger man than I am, because <laughs> if I found out something like that, I would be pissed. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but if you could, if you could do that, then congratulations. But, uh, you know, where is that energy going? Is that being stuffed down? Is that being held back, uh, before it's released? So yeah, we could definitely get dive into that. But, um, right now I want to, uh, shift and see if we can actually help Bill with these, uh, feelings that he's having. You know, we talked a lot about the philosophical nature of communication in a relationship and how we could absolutely uh, see things a different way or what we need to work on in our relationship so that it doesn't get to this point. However, let's talk about the, the meat and potatoes here, which is, and let me put you in this position, Matt, when, when your girlfriend says, you know, my ex has been trying, reaching out to me. She's been honest about that. And, uh, I've just been blocking him. I've been saying, you know, you know, it's great. Have a nice day. I've been, I've been respectful to my ex. And then she tells, you know, I'm going to travel to wherever her ex is, Mississippi, Alabama. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you're like, oh, that's interesting. You're going where your ex lives. Um, the feelings that might come up for you, if any. Um, and then she comes back and everything's great. And the, the, the texting and the messaging is stopped. And then suddenly you're at the dinner table and your friends mention, so how'd it go when you saw your ex? And you're like, what? What is this? So that the feelings that come up for you, and I'm just saying that so you could commiserate here with Bill. Yeah, yeah. Being in this position, what do you think Bill should do from this point now, from that information on? So I, I think that there's some internal reflection that, um, you know, if Bill wants to avoid this in, in the future with either this partner or a different partner, some internal reflection could be done to, to look at the source of, of some of that insecurity with the receiving the texts. And, and I understand that, that a lot of that had to do with the subconscious, you know, feeling that there was something off. Um, but it, it does seem to me that there there was a bit of uh, fixation on that, uh, why he didn't feel secure in that relationship. And, you know, why, what for him, why was that coming up as, as such a big major component to um, his overall well-being? So I, I would look into that um, because I'm the type of person who, you know, it, it wasn't always my go-to, but in recent years, I'll tend to look inward and see, okay, where where did I help co-create this? Um, because again, I want to put energy on the things that I can control. You yeah. know, and I can't I can't control the people's behavior, but I can control how I relate to it. I can control uh, to an extent some of those internal monologues I have 
um, I, I can at least look at and examine my limiting beliefs uh, about myself. Um, and so that's where I would start. Um, that's some of the messiest work. Yeah. Um, but I also think that work yields some of the most uh, transformational results because you're able to shift your paradigm. You know, the way that you see and and relate to yourself, other people's and, and life. And so I think that's a huge place to start. Um, another thing I would do, and this is a little bit more has to do with the relationship. I guess it's a little bit more external is write down your criteria, criteria slash guidelines slash standards, whatever you want to call it. Write down what those expectations are for you personally, Bill. This is how I, I expect to be treated. Uh, this is what I want to experience. This is the responsibility that I will uphold to myself and to my partner, whomever that might be. Get that down for yourself and just go through that exercise of putting it down. And I, I really do like to write these things down. You know, my wife and I have relationship standards written down. So, Bill, I would do that for yourself first. And then maybe down the line, once you've had some conversations uh, with your girlfriend, depending on you know what what transpires in the relationship, which way it goes, create the relationship standards as well, you know, with your partner, and then they can agree to them as well. And that's something that you can hold them accountable to. to. You can hold yourself accountable to them, and it doesn't 100% remove any you know the emotion from the equation. I think that's just incredibly hard when it gets down to to relationships. But it does allow you to make more objective decisions. Hmm. And so a lot of what I see and hear from, from your situation, Bill, are emotionally based decisions. Because it doesn't sound like you've got those criteria, those objective things that you can really plant yourself within, plant your flag within, and stand on. So that's why you know I use the word standard because it allows you to take a stand. And so, you know, the two big takeaways for you, Bill, I would do some of that internal reflecting. You know, maybe there's other folks you can talk to who can help kind of look at some of those, those confidence things, those just allow yourself to be more vulnerable about your position in this relationship and the meaning behind all of that. And then the second thing is put together those standards, you know, what you want for yourself and, and what you want to experience in your relationship. And then if there was a third thing, once you have your standards, hold them. Hold your standards. Like when you hold your standard, you're valuing yourself. Mm. You're, you're valuing yourself. And your partner, they're probably going to respond in some way. But who doesn't want to be with somebody who, when they plant their flag, when they say they're going to do something, they do it. They follow it up. Yeah. You know, they walk their talk. Yeah. One of the things that you just said was uh, co creation. And um, we've mentioned it before, but. What is your responsibility in the relationship for what happened in the relationship? Mm. What did you do to help cause what happened? And a lot of people will say, I did nothing. I'm the innocent one. I did absolutely nothing. Well, I can almost guarantee if you look at any past relationship that you've ever had, any failure, quote, failure that came up in the relationship or any um, relationship that broke up, you can see how you could have uh, done things differently. You can see yeah. it. You can see how you could have done things differently. If you can't see it, then you're not introspective enough. Then you're not reflective enough. Then you're not going inside going, I do have a level of responsibility in this relationship. And um, even the idea of, hmm, I see a red flag, but I'm going to ignore that red flag. And then that red flag turns into a blow up, turns into something else. You can look at, I can look at my own past relationships and go, I saw all these red flags. I didn't know what to do with them at the time, but now I do. Now I have these, this wisdom from my past failures, from my past relationships. And I can take that with me into my current relationship and go, okay, is this one of those red flags that leads to a blow up later? Because if it is, I need to address it now. So I always, yeah. I love the idea of hard truths. Let's talk about the hard truths. You know what, honey? Talking to Bill. Uh, he says, you know what, honey? I want to talk about this because I'm upset about it. And she goes, okay, let's hope that they can communicate with it. I trusted you. 
and you lied to me. And this conversation probably did take place with them. And that is, like you said, standards. I look at them as relationship values. That is against my values in a relationship. Mm -hmm. One of my top values in a relationship is trust. And then I have respect and I have having fun and, and, you know, all this other things and laughing. But if you violate that top value, I don't say you talk like this to your partner, but this is what you're feeling probably, Bill, that one of your values have been violated. And if that one of your top values is violated, then nothing else works. Yeah. Once, once there's a breakdown of the top value, then everything else breaks down, goes nowhere. And if you try to keep a relationship, knowing that your top values in the relationship are violated, it won't work. I've never seen it work. Same thing with anything in life, career. If you go to a career going, uh, my top value for a career is wanting weekends off. And then suddenly your boss gives you weekends to work. You're going to hate that job from that point on. And you're going to be like, well, I got to take it and I'm just going to work through it. And maybe something better will happen, but you'll, you'll be miserable from that point yeah. on. Unless yeah. your, unless your values change and things change in your life. So with your relationship, yes, you, like you said, Matthew, plant that flag is, uh, setting up your values, your standards, your criteria. Now, one thing that you said, Matthew, was let's, you know, write this criteria down uh, together. That to me feels like a prenuptial agreement. <laughs> Some people don't like that kind of feeling like, okay, I'm going to expect this in the relationship. I'm going to expect that in a relationship. But you could write down, you know, hey, these are my top five relationship values and then have your partner write down theirs. And then let's say, for example, we both have um, honesty at the top. And then I could say, well, what does honesty mean to me? Because it might be different from what it means to you. So, yeah, I don't I don't think you need to write down something like a prenup, (laughs) but just help the other person understand what your values are, what they mean to you. And, you know, you, you get to a place where it's like, okay, there's more clarity. Yeah. And also, even if you don't want to do that exercise, uh, being intrinsically integrated, if that's a way to put it, uh, with your own values. Yes. Planting your flags, having your standards, being integrated in alignment with those values so that you know when to stand up and say, no, that's not right. I won't accept that in this relationship. I won't. So, you know, you look at your girlfriend and go, I won't accept lies in the relationship, but you better be prepared to give her some sort of way to tell you the truth. I won't, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I won't accept lies in this relationship. So if you have something to say, and this is what I actually do in my own relationship. If you have something to say, I want you to tell me, even if it hurts, I want you to tell me, even if you know It will upset me. Even if you believe that I could leave you, I want you to tell me the hard truths at any cost. Because if we can get past these hard truths, then we're going to have a bond like no other. Mm. And I I really like that approach in relationships. And um, like I said, I've done it in this relationship. It's a huge, huge leap of faith. Because if you've never behaved this way towards your partner and suddenly you said, you know what? I have something to tell you. And you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm about to tell this to my partner. This yeah. could end it all. This could be a big blow up. This could be a breakup. But it's a leap of faith because you need to get into alignment with yourself. If you're not in alignment with yourself, with your own values, and you don't say anything, then the relationship stays miserable if it's been miserable. It never grows. It never evolves. Okay, I'm about to tell you something. This is a leap of faith. I don't know what's going to happen. You do it no matter what the consequences are so you can get the truth out, so you can come into alignment, so that when what you experience in your relationship and in yourself is authentic, you bring that full vulnerability to the table and so that you can have the most authentic, wonderful, happy experience that you can possibly have. It's not easy, but you take these leaps of faith and you keep finding out if the person you're with is the person that will stick with you through all the good and bad times. That's really what it comes down to. I'm having a bad moment. This is a bad thing. Is this person going to stick with me? Because I need to know. Otherwise, I have to hide it. And now I'm out of alignment with my values. I'm out of alignment with that person's values in a relationship because they want honesty. They want yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. 
So I'd like to say uh, one final thing, and of course I'll let you speak as well, but the the idea of feeling insecure, you know, I have a sense there's probably some jealousy in there too. Like this guy keeps coming up, he keeps showing up, and I feel this, I feel insecure. One of the the ways that I conquered my own insecurities and jealousy is, it's kind of funny, is I became the best damn lover I could become. I invested in myself and said, I'm going to show up as so great that when she thinks of her ex, he'll be this little tiny frog that is not worth thinking about because I'm showing up as this stallion. You know, it's Mm, kind of a funny way to put it, but I instill that in me and show up like that. And, you know, I treat her like a friggin' queen. <laughs> I treat her like a person that deserves my respect, my loyalty. And boy, does that really go a long way. Because I've, I've seen that in this relationship where she will have contact with an ex and there's almost a comparison that goes on. It's not like she's considering seeing the ex, but she just sees so much that she never had before. And so this is what I recommend, Bill, is that instead of focusing on your insecurity, instead of focusing on the past, instead of focusing on the lie, um, because it sounds like you want to keep the relationship. I mean, that's the top question, right? Do I want to keep the relationship? Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, if you answer yes, great. If I want to keep the relationship, then what's your focus from this point on? My focus is either going to be, oh, the pain, the lie, this and this, or the investment into yourself and the investment into creating a better tomorrow with her. How can I pour my, my energy into that? Yeah, but I still have these insecurities. What do I, what do I do about it? Then you show up as the best damn lover you can so that when she thinks about her ex, he gets smaller and smaller and smaller and you become larger than life in her eyes. Boy, when you start showing up like that, she's going to share things with you. Like you'll never believe what my ex said. I love you, baby. I miss you. It's going to be a totally different vibe. It won't be the, I better not, I don't want to tell my boyfriend about my ex. Oh my God. He contacted me again. It won't be that insecure place anymore. You won't make her feel insecure. So I, I, that's my last piece of advice for you, uh, Bill. And, um, I'm going to let Matthew, if you have anything else to add to that, uh, say something too. I think that's great advice. Absolutely. Because as somebody who has struggled with insecurity and absolutely still feel just cripplingly insecure moments, you know, they, they, they pop up, um, that can, can just wreak havoc on romantic relationships. And, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and so insecurity creeps in. Well, now I don't feel like I can serve my clients well. And, you know, it, it just, it, it, it permeates everything. So Paul, I really, I really dig your advice. And, and Bill, I, I think that introspection in, in my opinion has been the most challenging. Um, but like I said, it's the most, you, you can get the most out of it when you're committed to that process and, and committed to really examining why you feel the way you feel, you know, why the comparisons exist. And so, you know, it takes courage to reach out to a stranger, you know, it takes courage Bill, for you to write a, in a you know, a, an incredibly thorough and detailed email, just sharing this part of yourself. So I know you've you've got it. You know the courage is within you. The vulnerability is within you because you've opened up to to strangers in that way. So apply that same courage to going inward. Great. And you know, understand that you know it's like. You know, I love using analogies. So <laughs> for those listening, I think I've used three or four analogies already. <laughs> but, you know, when I'm cleaning my kitchen and I've got uh, my stovetop is all stuck with food and I spray the cleaner on it, it gets dirtier. You know, is that, a, is that a word? It gets more dirty before I can wipe it off and make it clean. Mm. So, Bill, when you do the introspection and you start to examine those insecurities and those things, understand that it may get and feel even more messy and you might feel more anxious and less clear and more insecure as you go through that. 
But understand that that's part of the process to healing some of those limiting beliefs and to shifting and transforming and growing. So you've got it. You've got all that stuff within you. And um, go go be awesome. That's my, my personal mantra is be awesome. Great. And um, thank you for sharing your vulnerabilities today, Matthew, because, uh, you know, you said some things that a lot of people wouldn't admit. And, you know, to say that to the general public, the people out there, I, I have my own, I wouldn't call them mantras, maybe philosophies. I have my own philosophy is that I feel better when I put myself out for judgment, even mm. though that's like, yeah. that's like the opposite of what most people feel. And when I started this show, one of the things I wanted to do, I think we've talked about this, is do the opposite of what most people do, to find out what happens. It's the, the experiments we can create for ourselves in our own lives. What would happen if instead of holding back what I want to say, that I actually say what I want to say? What, yeah. would, what would happen? Would I get punched in the face? Would I get fired? Let's see what happens. You know what? I've lived a long enough life. I could die. Let's see what happens. <laughs> now, that's not necessarily how I feel, but I, I do feel like almost a fearless warrior, 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 warrior on the battlefield. And um, the arrows are coming at me and I'm just walking through going, I'm just going to walk until I to reach the, the enemy line and then I'll take it from there. Not fearing death. And that could be the emotional fears that we have. That could be the fear of loss that we think we're going to lose someone or lose something in our life. All these fears that come up for us. What happens when we leap over that fear, take that leap of faith and go, you know what? I'm just going to do something uh, that I would normally be scared to do, you know, jumping into the fear. And I live also by the philosophy of, I think on this side of the equation of this is what I want to say or do and not the other side of the equation of, but there's a consequence. And I, so I have these two parts of the equation. And when I think of this is what I really want to say or do, I stay there before I get to the butt. I go, if I stay there and focus on that, then most of the, well, every single time I've done that, it has worked out for the better. Mm. It has worked out for the better. My relationships got stronger. My jobs promoted me and, and and transitioned me into better positions. It's like I thought the opposite was supposed to happen. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I don't say I do it every time. It doesn't mean I go up to the most violent person I can find out and say, this is what I really want to say to you. I, I pick my battles wisely. But I've learned that as you do this more and more, you show up more authentically. We're talking about authenticity and vulnerability today, that you develop more solidified relationships you develop more authentic more honest relationships so that crap like this doesn't happen i yeah. crap like the stuff that bill's going through so because i don't like feeling that i don't want to find out something that my girlfriend's been holding back on me well why was she holding back well let's go through all the the flags or the the, the co-creation process that i was responsible for and what could i have done differently so that she didn't feel like she had to keep it from me so this is a topic that could go on and on and on. There was a lot of stuff that you said in your letter, Bill. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Matthew, thank you so much for joining me. You can find Matthew at the uh, Having It All podcast and also doing it at home for uh, home birthing and, and such. Uh, he does that with his wife, right? Correct. Yes. Great. And is there any place that else they could find you or did I cover everything? Uh, you can go check out MatthewBivens.com. Got links to all the podcasts and all the cool stuff like that. And um, Paul, I just want to say thank you. Um, I appreciate our friendship and uh, I appreciate and value our relationship. And so uh, it means a lot to me that you would invite me to, to come on your show and um, just to, to take part in this powerful, fascinating, humbling and eye opening conversation so thank you, man. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm honored by your words, Matthew. And I do appreciate our friendship as well. And uh, I really liked the direction that you took the conversation today and um, really reminded me of some of the stuff that we had to talk about. And I love the different analogies that you use because it's so different than what I, <laughs> what I how I think. So I think analogies are great to use and metaphors and things like that. But anyway, Matthew, thank you again. Very much appreciate your time and your thoughts. And like I said, for anyone listening, this is an experiment. 
This is, um, I don't know if I said that. Maybe I didn't say that, but this is an experiment. This is going to go on sort of like a midweek, uh, episode of the overwhelmed brain. I'm not going to replace the weekend episode quite yet, uh, with anything. I don't know if it's ever going to be replaced. I'm just saying that this is kind of an experiment. If this turns out well, if, um, there's good reception or if I feel like doing it again, I will. The conversation is really more, I've noticed when I analyze it right now, was more of the, the breaking down of behavior and understanding the philosophy behind, behind certain behaviors, behind the emotions. And it was sort of an intellectual conversation, uh, and also sharing of personal stories, which I love, uh, that really helps maybe with the critical thinkers out there on how to approach their own life. So I really like the idea that this really is expanding into a philosophy of life, a philosophy of thinking, a philosophy of thinking of how your relationship can go better, be better. Um, so like I said, experimental, we'll see where, what happens. I always love talking with you, Matthew. Thank you for your time today. And we're going to end it right here. Have a good one. Welcome back. Thank you so much to Matthew Bivens of the Having It All podcast and the Doing It at Home podcast. He's one step ahead of me. He has two podcasts. <laughs> no, he's a great guy. He seems to have a really good head on his shoulders for 31. I mean, it sounds like I'm looking at him like a child and he's not. But I remember when I was 31, I was still holding on to a lot of stuff that I hadn't healed from yet. Because my breakdown was at 35. Hopefully he's already had, <laughs> just like a lot of people listening now, hopefully you've already had your breakdown, if that is in the works. I don't know. But when you repress that negativity throughout life, the breakdown, if you want to heal and grow and get out of that negativity, the breakdown can sometimes be the turning point. Can be what happens the day before you feel lighter and you can move on and get on with your life without that thing or those things holding you back. You know what those things are. They're your emotional triggers. It's like, oh, so-and-so said this and it makes me so angry and I've been holding on to that anger. Or this person did this when I was very young and I've been holding on to that. Or what's worse is that when you hold on to feelings about yourself that somebody caused you to feel. I know you might be thinking, nobody can cause you to feel anything. Well, I disagree. <laughs> I mean, that's a common thing, right? Nobody is responsible for your emotions. Nobody can cause you to feel that way. You end up doing it that way yourself because you're processing it. You're handling it. Yes, I get it. I understand it. And I agree with you. At the same time, I don't agree with the idea that nobody else can cause that because there are very, very crafty people out there, manipulators, emotional abusers that subtly chip away at who you are. They chip away at your self-worth. They chip away at your self-esteem. They chip away at your identity until you're left with these negative feelings about yourself. Then you have these beliefs and perceptions about the world that aren't necessarily true. I mean, this can happen when you're a child. How do you control your emotions when you're a child when you only have a few years of existence on the earth? That's what I'm talking about, is that some people can take control of your emotional state and make you feel a certain way. They don't do it directly. They don't say, I want you to feel angry. They do subtle things or overt things or whatever. Like a child might have overt things done to them. They may be abused. They may be criticized. They may be neglected, rejected, so on and so forth until they develop certain beliefs and behaviors in the world that don't serve them when they're adults. And, you know, when they're children, there are survival mechanisms. When they're adults, we keep them as childhood survival mechanisms instead of transforming them into 
um, learning lessons that we can grow from. I mean, I've been there. I, I've had survival mechanisms most of my life, and uh, to transform those is a process. It's this whole self-help, self-healing, or other people helping you heal, other people helping you get through it process. It takes steps. And what we talked about today are some of those steps, are some of the ways that you can start that process uh, you know, I always talk about honoring yourself, getting into alignment with your values and, you know, questioning your own beliefs. I mean, this show is built on critical thinking. Question what you believe to be true. I believe this to be true. Then you ask, does that serve me? Does my belief serve me? Do, do these beliefs serve me? And then you go through life trying to answer those questions. It gives you some meaning when you don't have any meaning. Gives you some purpose when you don't have any purpose. You know, some people don't have purpose. What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of all this? When you ask yourself questions, do my beliefs serve me? What are my beliefs? What do I believe because somebody else convinced me to believe those beliefs? What am I doing today that doesn't seem to be working? Who do I hang out with that is toxic for me? What am I exposing myself to every day that makes me feel bad? All of these questions that we start to really think critically on and decide to take action on, or at least decide to start thinking about, especially in a different way. Like that's one of the things I talked about recently. I forget on, I don't know if it was a patron episode or this show or what, but the idea that you can look at what you're doing, like the people that you attract and how often you end up in a crappy relationship. If you keep attracting those crappy relationships, then are you showing up as the same person with the same beliefs and the same ideas about the people that you're meeting, about the world? Or do you keep showing up that way and wonder why you keep ending up with the same type of people? Because it might be time to change your beliefs. I think the example I gave, oh, I remember, it was for that interview I did on the Awakening Mindset Summit. If you go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash awake, there's a uh, Awakening Mindset Summit that uh, Johnny Helleland is putting on, and uh, it, it features over 20 speakers, uh, and I'm one of them. So we recorded a conversation, and uh, you can get those tickets for free now, but by December 11th, 2017, I think after that point, you have to pay for them. So I would highly recommend you go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash awake and see not only me, but uh, like 19 or 20 other speakers talk about awakening your mind and Johnny asks you what are the alternatives to being burned out at school or work or how do you mindfully find clarity purpose vitality and passion in your life so I'm part of that summit this this is where this is all coming from <laughs> I remember talking about showing up differently in your like when someone was dating like when you're dating and you keep attracting the wrong partners and you're thinking that everyone in the world is terrible and you might as well just be single or change your sexual orientation or something. But what happens is the person that keeps attracting the wrong partner has a belief system, has perceptions about what a good relationship should be. And the example I gave is um, the woman who meets a guy who showers her with gifts and love and compliments, and she thinks she's found the greatest guy on earth or woman, whoever she's attracted to. And she can look back at her past relationships and see that that has happened before and go, wait, maybe I should take a lesson from this. Maybe this, quote, love bombing, that's what it's called, is not good. Maybe this is a sign that something might not be right with the relationship. I might be getting sucked into the same situation as I did before. But then they think, yes, but I love feeling loved and I love feeling wanted. I don't want to feel that rejection. I don't want to lose this feeling. But the problem is that can be a manipulation. That can be a way that someone gets you under their wing, under their spell, and then they change after you fall in love with them. That happens. I talk about it in the Mean Workbook. It's emotional abuse. But that's what we talked about on the, um, the interview too. And if you're part of the patron program, you've actually heard this interview, or you can, because it's one of the private episodes in there. So you can check that out if you're in the patron program. Otherwise, uh, like I said, theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash awake. You can listen to me on December 11th when they run the summit. 
And anyway, my whole point is that these beliefs and perceptions about the world that you carry with you throughout life may not work for you. Just look at your results. Start thinking critically about what you believe. Because I used to go through life thinking, I know what's right. I know what I believe is true. Because why would I question myself? If I question myself, then I might feel inferior. I might feel stupid. I don't want to feel stupid, so I won't question myself. And then I feel stupid because <laughs> it doesn't work out. So I feel stupid anyway, so I might as well just question myself. I might as well question my beliefs. Even today, I still question what I believe. Not that I doubt it. It's to continue expanding my knowledge, expanding my mind, and making sure that I'm on a path that serves me. I want your path to serve you. So keep an open mind so that you can step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something that I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. that I did in my marriage, and this is so, so key, is making the choice to, instead of focusing on all my judgments against my wife, because that's where I was, I was very judgmental, instead of focusing on all, everything she's doing wrong and everything she needs to change, one day after we separated, but we weren't still, we were still together, after she left, I was by myself one day, and I was like, what do I need to do? What can I do that's any different than I'm doing now? Because my relationship isn't going well. Mm. What can I do differently? And, and I said, I spend so much time wanting her to change. And it came yeah. to me. It just came to me. I spend so much time. Yeah. If she changed, I'll be happier. Our relationship will be better. Just waiting for her to change. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? If I don't, and I don't know where this came from. If I don't like it, why don't I just leave? So that was my first thought. If I don't like what she's doing, why am I sticking around? That first thought came up. It doesn't mean I was going to leave. It just it came up. You know, I allow these thoughts to come up. Let's process it. Let's work with it. And I said, wait, I spend so much time focused on her stuff and her problems. What can I do differently to either accept who she is, regardless of if she changes or not, or... I can't stand it to the point where I have to. I just wanted to share that little excerpt from the rest of the uh, conversation that Matthew and I had, which the uh, totality of that interview is at the patron site, patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you soon.